Go ahead and start on time. Uh, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. We've got a little bit of spring fever going on. Beautiful day. I uh, hope you're able to get out and enjoy it later on. Uh, do we have any questions about things coming up? Uh, just a reminder that lab will be uh, back over here this week. So, uh, YS HB 134 uh, downstairs. Uh, for those uh, who haven't done lab yet, uh, make sure that you wear good shoes. Um, after yesterday, I was just a little bit concerned about the surface uh, in there. It's, it's not the best for jumping, but uh, we made it through the lab. And, uh, but just remember, wear some good supportive uh, athletic shoes for the for the lab if you're coming on Thursday. Uh, do you have any other questions about lab or uh, we will have one more exam uh, over chapter seven and eight uh, before the final. Uh, the final exam will be uh, just like a regular exam, non-comprehensive, probably just over chapter nine content. So I think we'll probably make it all the way through chapter nine and that will end the semester. Uh, so today, uh, we are moving on. We are starting on uh, chapter seven. And so if you remember, uh, a few chapters ago, back in chapter three, we talked about linear kinetics. Uh, now we're gonna talk about angular kinetics and how Newton's laws apply to angular motion. So, uh, throughout this textbook, there's a common theme about classifying things uh, as linear or angular when you put them together to have general motion. So, I think it's important uh, as we think about math for linear and angular motion uh, to keep the units straight. So, uh, to start off with, if we look at the top half of the table here, things from a linear standpoint, uh, mass is, of course, in kilograms. Force is in uh, newtons. And if you remember, linear momentum is mass multiplied by velocity. Uh, so kilogram meters per second. And then we talked about impulse and the applications in sports. Uh, generating a force over a period of time to cause an increase or decrease in momentum. So our units for impulse are newton seconds, so force multiplied by time. Uh, so as we get into this chapter and consider things from an angular standpoint, uh, we have the same concepts, uh, but we think of it in terms of angular motion rather than linear motion. So angular motion revolves around an axis. So there has to be an axis. And that's how movement takes place in our bodies. Uh, our joints represent the axes of, a of our body around which uh, the limbs rotate. So rather than inertia, we have the moment of inertia. So we have to consider not only the mass, but how the mass is distributed. So that's a little bit different. So there's two things uh, that can affect the inertia of an object that's uh, moving it from an angular standpoint. Uh, torque, a moment of force. So if you remember torque, you have a force that's supplied uh, at a certain distance from the axis. Remember what we call the, that distance here, abbreviated with the lowercase r. Remember that, what, what that was referred to? Yeah, the moment arm. So the, the moment of force and the moment arm. So how far off center a force is applied relative to the axis that causes 
uh, rotation of the body or object. Uh, angular momentum, okay, uh, capital H for angular momentum. Uh, so two things, the moment of inertia multiplied by angular velocity. Moment of inertia multiplied by angular velocity. So it's a little bit different than just linear momentum because mass uh, is constant. However, with angular momentum, the moment of inertia can vary based on how the mass of a body or object is distributed. So there's a couple factors that uh, are considered with angular momentum. Uh, angular impulse, much like uh, linear impulse, uh, you have two things multiplied together, but in this case, because it's rotation, we have the torque that is multiplied by the time. So think of something rotating around an axis, uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise, and the amount of torque applied over a period of time determines how much of an angular impulse we have and how much of a change in angular momentum there will be. So just as we had a relationship between linear impulse and linear momentum, uh, we have a similar relationship between angular impulse uh, and angular momentum. So it's just, it's the same concepts, just thinking in terms of angular versus linear. Okay, so just a question for you to consider and you don't need to answer, but uh, a key question for this chapter, how do figure skaters, divers, and gymnasts speed up or slow down their rate of spin? So how many of you watched the Olympics and uh, seen a figure skater go into a spin and at the beginning of the spin, their arms are out here and then they bring their arms in and what did you notice about how fast they were spinning as they brought their arms in? to speed up. So there seems to be a relationship between how someone's body mass is distributed, either further away from the axis of their body or more concentrated close to the axis of their body and uh, angular velocity. So in fact, the relationship is inverse. So uh, as we bring more mass close to the axis or center of our body, that increases uh, the angular velocity and vice versa. So uh, angular inertia. So let's talk about things from a linear standpoint first and then talk about things from an angular standpoint. So do you remember what that term inertia means? What is that term inertia? So the reason we wear seat belts is because of inertia. Newton's first law, the law of inertia, an object or body will stay at rest or continue in a constant state of motion unless what? acted upon by a net external force from a linear standpoint or a net external torque from an angular standpoint. So inertia, whether linear or angular, is resistance to motion or <coughs> resistance to having a change uh, in the state of motion. So it's resistance to change. So from a linear standpoint, all that we consider is mass. So a larger object or body will have more resistance to a change in the state of linear motion. From an angular standpoint, we have two factors to consider. Uh, the first one is mass. Okay, so a larger object or body will have a uh, more resistance to rotation. Uh, but we also have to consider um, how the object or body's mass is distributed. So there's two factors to consider when we talk about angular inertia. So how, how large an object or body is and uh, how the object or body's mass is distributed about an axis. So angular inertia, uh, another uh, way of describing that is moment of inertia. And so angular inertia is directly proportional to the mass of an object or body. Um, so if you uh, consider sports implements that you swing, so how many types of sports implements do we swing? Think of 
all the different implements that we use as part of sports, rackets and clubs and so on, bats. Uh, heavier implements are more difficult to stop, start swinging or stop swinging. So that's angular inertia, resistance to angular momentum. Uh, angular inertia is also determined by the distribution. So how that mass is distributed relative to an axis. So this also has a lot to do with our bodies. Remember in kinesiology when we studied different planes of motion? How many different planes of motion do we have? What are the three cardinal planes of motion? Well, front to back motion we say is through the, the sagittal plane, right? Side to side is frontal and then and then rotation about an axis would be transverse plane. So the human body can have multiple axes. So we move through a plane and movement through a plane revolves around an axis. It has a 90 degree relationship to the plane. So we can consider angular inertia in terms of multiple axes in the body. So it's, it's context specific. Are we talking about motion through the sagittal plane, uh, about the axis for the sagittal plane? Remember the axis for the sagittal plane? So I want you to, uh, what, let's go ahead and make a little bit of a table right now. So let's, I want you to go ahead and list those cardinal planes of motion. So let's start with sagittal, the sagittal plane. And underneath that, I want you to write frontal plane. And then underneath that, I want you to write transverse plane. And then I want you to make another column and let's list the, the corresponding axes for each of these planes of motion. So uh, for the sagittal plane, uh, there are a few different terms that refer to the same axis. So this particular textbook uses the transverse axis for the sagittal plane, the transverse axis for the sagittal plane. Some of the other names that may be in other classes with other textbooks that talk about planes, uh, maybe you've heard of the frontal axis for the sagittal plane. Um, other textbooks might say the coronal axis for the sagittal plane. So there's different terms that refer to the same axis. So just so we're clear on, on that. So three different names for the same axis for the sagittal plane. Um, let's just go with this textbook um, and say, let's call it the transverse axis. So for this, this class, let's use the transverse axis for the sagittal plane. Okay, so for the frontal plane, uh, there's a few different terms. For the frontal plane, sometimes the axis is called the anterior-posterior axis. So movement occurring through the frontal plane takes place around the anterior-posterior axis. Sometimes the anterior-posterior axis is called the sagittal axis. So a couple of, of different terms there. Okay, so now the transverse plane. Um, this particular textbook uh, refers to the axis, welcome Jackie, for the transverse plane as the longitudinal axis longitudinal axis for the transverse plane. So let's use that term, but as a, as a side note, you might also find vertical axis or twist axis. So maybe those are some of the other terms you've heard uh, in other classes. Okay, so angular inertia, capital I, for angular inertia is equal to the product of mass multiplied by the distribution of mass squared. So the, the distribution of mass is referred to as 
the radius of gyration. It's the radius of gyration of these squares. So based on that formula, you can see that the distribution of mass is the more important factor. So if we double the radius of gyration, that increases the angular inertia by four-fold, by four times, because the radius of gyration is, is squared. So we define that as the distance from the axis of rotation to where the object's mass is most concentrated. So, as you know, in this class we talk a lot about practical examples. So let's take a practical example about distribution of mass. So with the exercise, the way that we distribute the mass of our body, or where we hold the weight, uh, determines muscle activity. So we can increase or decrease muscle activity, increase or decrease the intensity of an exercise based on how the mass of our bodies is distributed, based on where the weight is positioned relative to the joint axis. So this is a, a study that I participated in back in 2014 with a couple of other colleagues, so Brad Schoenfeld and Brett Contreras, and a couple of other Brazilian guys, and I don't want to try to pronounce their names, but we looked at uh, different variations of a simple plank. So all of you have done planks and planks. So this is a figure from the study. And so the variations of planks were as follows. This was the traditional plank. So the pelvis in a neutral position. So what does that mean for the pelvis to be in a neutral position? <coughs> So as you're sitting there in your chair, I want you to tilt your pelvis to the front. Just so you let your pelvis tilt to the front like a bucket. You can tilt your pelvis back, right? Okay. So the pelvis in the neutral position is right in the middle, where the where the where the um, crest of ilium is level. You could say so. Nice neutral pelvis, everything locked in place, elbows underneath the shoulders, traditional plank. Okay, so uh, in B, this was a posterior tilt. So I want you to imagine doing a plank, but holding your pelvis in a posterior tilt. So what happens to the low back when we posteriorly tilt the pelvis? So you're sitting there thinking you can tilt your pelvis back, and what happens to the, the lumbar region of the spine? It tends to, in a neutral position, there's, there's just that normal lordotic curve. So when we tilt the pelvis back, that flattens a little bit. So we have a flattening of that lumbar portion. Okay, so uh, in C, this is a long lever plank. How many have done this one by the show of hands? So that's pretty intense. So what we're doing, in this case, how it applies to this chapter, is we're taking some of our body mass and we're doing what? We're moving it further from, from our rotation axis. So we're taking our arms and we're moving them forward as our support point. So now the elbows are ahead of the shoulders there. Okay, so very last one was a combination of the two. So now we have a long lever plank with a uh, posterior tilt. Long lever plank with a posterior tilt. So how do we measure muscle activity? Those of you who've had kinesiology? Yeah, electromyography is right. So what we did is we looked at uh, the muscles of, of the abdomen. Okay, so we looked at uh, the erector spinae, okay, we looked at the upper region of the rectus abdominis, and there's, there's standardized locations for 
these electrodes. Um, the lower abdominal stabilizers. Okay, so within uh, electromyography research, uh, with surface electromyography specifically, you can't separate activation of the internal obliques from the transverse abdominis. You can't do it because those fibers blend together. So um, in the lower abdominal stabilizers, you're talking about right down here near the belt, near the belt line, down here, the fibers of the uh, internal obliques and transverse abdominis blending together. So collectively, uh, those are referred to as the lower abdominal stabilizers. Uh, and lastly, the external obliques. Okay. So a couple things, is, as you notice here, for the four conditions, traditional, long lever, posterior tilt, and long lever, posterior tilt. Um, overall, you look at the combination of long lever and posterior tilt, and you're getting 148% for the external obliques, 153% for the lower abdominal stabilizers, and 109% for the upper rectus abdominis. This is a percentage of a maximal voluntary contraction. So remember in kinesiology how we took standardized contractions after we collected data? So that's how you express your EMG values is as a percentage of a maximal contraction. So that's what these values represent. Uh, something else to notice is that we're not getting very much erector spinae activity with a plank. And many of you know that it's more of an anterior chaining type exercise. So it's the front muscles that we are activating. And the erector spinae is activated just a little bit, probably pulling up a little bit on the back side of the pelvis. Um, you can compare a few of the different variations here, like the lower abdominal stabilizers, it appears that the long lever is significantly different from the posterior tilt. Both of these are better than just the traditional, but when you go with a long lever and posterior tilt, can you see how those values just jump? So uh, the, the applied message is next time you're doing planks, and as I look over this class, you're all advanced exercisers. You know, you may want to consider both the long lever and the posterior tilt because that's going to give you the greatest intensity or activation levels. So, varying the distribution of our body mass can make a difference in exercise intensity. So as we move on to angular momentum, uh, remember linear momentum is equal to mass multiplied by velocity. So two things. Angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia multiplied by angular velocity. So moment of inertia, again, is not the same as just mass. Mass uh, remains constant, so any change in linear momentum is really dependent on a change in velocity. Whereas uh, with angular momentum, if mass is constant, we can still have a change in moment of inertia through a change in how the mass is distributed, so the radius of gyration, and also what angular velocity is equal to. So two things can affect our angular momentum. So that's what this slide is about. So just remember, for our bodies, we can have a change in the distribution of mass uh, or the angular velocity uh, to change angular momentum. So as, as we talked about a few minutes ago, uh, our bodies can have up to three axes about which the mass of our bodies are distributed. 
So the transverse axis is for the sagittal plane, so that's front to back type movements. So think of the axis as having a 90 degree relationship to the plane of motion. Uh, for the frontal plane, we have this anterior posterior axis. So side to side motions around this anterior posterior axis. And then for the transverse plane, uh, we have the longitudinal axis. So think about rotation type movements like swinging a baseball bat uh, or doing a, say a Russian twist with a medicine ball would be uh, in the transverse axis around, or in the transverse plane around the longitudinal axis. <coughs> Okay, so let's take some applied scenarios in sports. Um, the figure skating example. So I want you to consider the, the inverse relationship between moment of inertia and angular velocity. So as a figure skater abducts their arms at the shoulder joint, that creates a high moment of inertia because the mass of her body is distributed further from the longitudinal axis around which she's rotating. And so because of the high moment of inertia, that's going to slow down her, how fast she's spinning. So we have a slower angular velocity. Uh, in this case, uh, it's exactly the opposite. So bringing the arms in, so adducting the arms, flexing the elbows, we have a lower moment of inertia, but a much higher uh, angular velocity. So we can manipulate how fast our bodies are rotating based on distribution of our body mass. Could be the same thing with diving in a layout versus a tuck position in a layout position like this, we have a very large moment of inertia um, with a small angular velocity. So there's a, there's a greater resistance to rotation. Uh, whereas in a tuck position, we have a much smaller moment of inertia. Everything is tightly packed around the axis of rotation. And so that allows a greater angular velocity. Okay, so let's, let's do some practice problems here. So I want you to take out a sheet of paper, put your name at the top. I want you to work with a partner. And just, just to reinforce concepts here, uh, you'll turn this in at the end of today. So name at the top, practice problem number one. So talk to each other. I'll be walking around. So anterior posterior axis is which plane again? Frontal. 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 Yeah.
So for question one, consider how the mass is distributed. Look at all four. Generally consider where the mass is relative to the axis. It's not a trick question. Give you just a couple more minutes to finish up, then we'll get back together. So, um, question one, what's the consensus on that one? Who has the tightest distribution of mass about the center of their body? Yeah, I would say Donna is a good candidate. Who would you rank next after Donna? <coughs> slightly, slightly more. Yeah. Bryn. Okay. Next. Anna, right? And then the 
largest moment of inertia would be bathrooms. Right? Okay, so let's say they're spinning with the same angular velocity now. So the same angular velocity. So because they have different moments of inertia, they don't have the same uh, angular momentum, but they can have the same rate of spin. Okay, so if they're, if they're all spinning at the same angular velocity, the one with the largest moment of inertia is going to have the highest angular momentum. So if they're all spinning with the same angular velocity, the one with the largest moment of inertia is going to have the highest angular momentum. The one with the lowest moment of inertia is going to have the least angular momentum. So which one? Don. In this case. Don. In this case. So they're all spinning with the same angular velocity. The one with the lowest moment of inertia is going to have the least amount of angular momentum. Okay, so now if we consider that if their angular momentum is the same, so all four have the same angular momentum, okay, their moment of inertia is different, which means their angular velocities are going to be different. So if their angular momentum is the same, which one's going to be spinning the slowest? Bathroom. Which one's going to be spinning the fastest? Don. So if these two dancers have the same angular momentum, okay, but their moment of inertias are different, how are they able to have the same angular momentum? It has to be due to their spin rate, right? So to have the same angular momentum as Catherine, Don is going to have to be spinning a lot faster to compensate for the smaller moment of inertia. Catherine, because of her large moment of inertia, is going to have to be spinning a lot slower to have the same angular momentum as Don. So with angular momentum, you have to consider two things. You have to consider the moment of inertia as well as the angular velocity. But with moment of inertia, you have to consider how the mass is distributed. Okay, so practice problem three. Let's see. Maybe I skip. Yeah, practice problem two. Let's take this one. So three different dies. So the overall angular velocity throughout the dive is the same because it's the same number of revolutions and the same amount of time in all three. So what determines angular momentum would be different moments of inertia, distribution of body mass. So which one would have the largest overall throughout the entire dive? Dive one, right? smallest overall angular momentum. Okay, so if angular velocity is the same, the overall angular momentum is going to be smallest. 
where the smallest moment of inertia would be by two, right? right? In which dive will Anne be rotating the slowest and fastest about her transverse axis just before? So if we consider just before the layout, okay, so in this position, this position, this position, which one is she going to be rotating the fastest? So in which one is her angular inertia the smallest, which will allow her to spin the fastest? Five, two is right. So the more tuck position will have the fastest angular velocity, the pike position will be next, and then the layout position will be the slowest angular velocity. So there's an inverse relationship between the distribution of mass and angular velocity. As one goes up, the other goes down, and vice versa. Okay, one more, and then we'll do some other stuff. So to get you started on part A, what two things do we need to know to calculate moment of inertia? Mass. Have we got mass? Yep, 50 kilograms. What else do we need? <coughs> Radius of, of gyration, which describes the distribution of mass. Have we got that for takeoff? The radius of the gyration about her transverse axis at takeoff is 0.4 meters. But what do we have to do to that 0.4 meters to calculate moment of inertia? We have to square it, right? So start there, mass times radius of gyration squared. So it gives you kilogram meters squared for moment of inertia. So part B, if we know if we know angular momentum at takeoff, which is it remains constant throughout the dive in this case. So throughout the dive, her angular momentum about her transverse axis is 20 kilogram meters squared over seconds. So we have angular momentum. Okay, we just calculated moment of inertia at takeoff. So now this is asking you to solve for angular velocity. Okay, now let's step back a chapter to chapter six. What were the units for angular velocity? It's not meters per second, that's linear velocity. What are units for angular velocity? What, you, what are units are you gonna be using for your answer in this problem? Radians per second. Radians per second is the unit for angular velocity. So you're going to have 20 kilogram meters squared over seconds is equal to the moment of inertia. What'd you get for part A? What'd you get for your moment of inertia in part A? Eight, okay, so it'd be eight kilogram meter squared, and then how would you solve for angular velocity then? So just using your basic algebra, what do you need to do? Divide 20 by what? By eight. To get angular velocity, and your units for angular velocity are radians per, per second. What are you coming up with for your answer? Radians per second. 
2.5 radians per second. So we just took our angular momentum, 20 kilogram meters squared over seconds, okay, that's H. You solved for the angular inertia in part A, which was eight kilogram meters squared. And so all you're doing is just dividing both sides of the equation by the, mo by the moment of inertia. So 20 divided by eight gives you 2.5 radians per second. That's how fast she's rotating from the angular standpoint at takeoff, 2.5 radians per second. Okay, so let's do the second half. After Lisa tucks, if she's tucking, what do you expect is going to happen to angular velocity? So now she's pulling all of her mass close to her axis. What's going to happen to her spin? It's going to be greater than 2.5 radians per second. It's going to go up because she's bringing her mass closer to the axis. So after Lisa tucks, what is her moment of inertia? You would expect the moment of inertia to be larger or smaller after she tucks. It's going to be smaller, right? Smaller moment of inertia after she tucks, which does what to her rate of spin? It's going to bring it up. Okay, so after Lisa tucks, what is her moment of inertia? So Lisa tucks and reduces her radius of gyration about her transverse axis to 0.2 meters. So how do we need to get how do we need to get moment of inertia in this case? Mass oops, mass multiplied by what do we need to do to point to? Square it. Tell me what you come up with. Fifty multiplied by point two squared. You should come up with a smaller Moment of inertia, what'd you get? Three. Two kilogram meters squared. Now, at the beginning of the problem, we said angular momentum about her transverse axis is the same throughout the dive. So all you're doing is solving for angular velocity the same way, but now she's in a different position. So now she's in a tuck position. So 20 kilogram meters squared over seconds divided by two kilogram meters squared, what is your new angular velocity? Should be faster than 2.5 radians per second. Now it's what? 10 radians per second. So because in a tuck position, she has a smaller moment of inertia, her rotation is going to be faster. Is there any questions on, on that? You understand how that works with as one goes up, the other goes down. Okay. All right, so let's talk about some more practical stuff. So track and field athletes, I'm looking at you. So which of these would be the better method of sprinting really fast? With more knee flexion on the swing phase or less knee flexion on the swing phase? So we're talking about as the leg comes through. And why? And how does it relate to this chapter? Okay, so I can swing my leg with my knee extended like this, or I can have my knee bent, and I can pop it up. So for, for the swing phase, you'd want more deflection. So has the mass of the leg changed between this picture and this picture? What changed? It's not the mass of the leg. What is it? Moment of inertia is equal to mass multiplied by what squared? Radius of gyration squared. So it's not the mass that changed. It's how we distribute the mass. So because the radius of gyration is smaller with the knee flexed, that means a smaller moment of inertia and a smaller moment of inertia means what for angular velocity? It means it's going to increase. So inverse. So we try to, to make the leg have the smallest moment of inertia possible because that determines how fast we can swing 
the leg through on the recovery. It's called the recovery phase of a, of a sprint stride. So you can see here with elite sprinters how close Carl Lewis has his heel pulled almost right up to his glute to minimize that moment of inertia, which allows him to move the leg through the recovery phase much faster. So you think about this in terms of, of technique drills. Um, I think about this in terms of how we should do, for lack of a better term, how many of you have done the butt kicker technique drill for sprints? If you look at how a sprinter actually runs, there's a lot of coaches that will, that will ask athletes to do butt kickers with the knee pointed straight down like this, but how should your knee be if you're doing the butt kickers drill? Should be right here, holding the heel up close to the hip that way because that's exactly what happens during a sprint. Okay, now before we get to this slide, what I would like to do is just show you this. We'll come back to it. I want to show you this video about the technology of golf clubs. And as, as we're watching this video, I want you to think about this question. <coughs> so if you want to write this question down, just write it down on your note sheet so we can discuss it afterwards. How is the mass of a club head distributed in modern drivers to increase angular inertia about the twist axis? How is the mass of a club head distributed in modern drivers to increase angular inertia about the twist axis? So the twist axis is is this. There's different axes, but we're talking about how square you're able to hit the ball. So if you don't hit the ball square, what is that called? It's called a slice or a, or a hook. How many of you are golfers? I know golfers. So it's going to either do this or it's going to go here. It's not going to go straight down the fairway. So we're talking about we increasing the resistance to rotation about the twist axis. So how are, how are club heads designed so we can hit the ball square with less tendency to rotate one way or the other? So let's go ahead and play this for you for about five minutes. For the 2013 U.S. Open, the best golfers in the world will gather at one of the country's most notable and historic courses, Marion Golf Club in Pennsylvania. The 2013 U.S. Open will be the 18th U.S. Tour Championship held in Marion. Uh, this will be the fifth U.S. Open held there. Known for its wicker basket flagsticks, Marion is one of the most celebrated golf courses in the country, with its East Course dating back to 1912. Some of golf's greatest players have made history here. Olin Dutra. Dorothy Porter, Ben Hogan, Lee Trevino, among others. Beyond just tradition and history, the 2013 U.S. Open will showcase how the design and engineering of the golf club has evolved over the decades. The earliest golf clubs were really handcrafted. They had no standard shape or form, but they were made by individual craftsmen over in Scotland. Most golf clubs were originally made from hardwoods, like persimmon, used not only for its durability, but also for its high-density mass. Persimmon is hard and it's dense, so you can get a club mass with very easy to get a fairly small package, and it's strong. Mass is the measurement of an object's resistance to acceleration. The more mass of an object, the more force is required to accelerate it. Mac Pringle, an engineer at the United States Golf Association Research and Test Center, says the mass of the club head is crucial to increasing the amount of force that's imparted onto the ball, making it travel faster and farther. The more mass of a club head, the more force it produces. From an engineering perspective, we're creating a club that's, that's large and distributes the weight over a big volume. 
gives you the flexibility. That's a great choice. Not only is the club's mass important, but how it's distributed in the club head can allow for more control when hitting the ball. This control is due to something in physics called rotational inertia, a scientific principle that says the farther an object's mass is away from the axis of rotation, the harder it is for the object to rotate. Back then, there was this feeling like, well, I want to get, I want to get the mass right behind the ball so I can, so I can hit the ball and you know, give it a good solid hit. Now we know it's better to spread that mass. So. At the USGA Research and Test Center, engineers test clubs to ensure that technology isn't more important than skill in golf. In the main test lab, they use a robotic arm to swing clubs at controlled speeds to test their effectiveness. For this demo, Pringle first loads an older wood club. We've got an old-fashioned uh, laminated maple wood head. Because it's wood, it tends to be a lot smaller than driving the sword. So that if we hit it on something, it's going to twist a lot more at impact. And that means it's going to lose a lot of ball speed and it's going to start offline more. Because the club head is made of wood, its spring quality, or ability to store and release the energy of the ball's impact, is lessened, which reduces the ball's speed. Instead, some energy is lost in the form of sound and heat. During the impact, the ball compresses, takes up all the energy of impact, and, and releases it, and none of it is stored in the club like it is with a modern gun. Around 1980, metal club heads began to replace wood as the preferred material used in drivers. And the first material to be used for woods at that time were stainless steel. The clubs were fairly small, the base material and the shells were quite thick compared to what they are today. Using metal instead of wood, engineers could design hollow club heads, making them larger but lightweight to make it easy to swing while still maintaining their durability. We're not increasing the mass at all, but increasing the size of the club makes it more forgiving to hit. Today, one of the more common metals used for club heads is titanium, which is more flexible than stainless steel and much lighter, allowing for an even larger club head. This is a pure titanium club, and it's considerably larger than a wood club. It might even be a little lighter than a wood one, but what they've done now is taken that weight is hollow, so all the weight is right at the outside, as far away from the center mass as they can get it, which then makes it on off-center hits twist a lot less than a wooden counterpart. The modern club also increases the spring quality of the club head when it impacts the ball. It's got a fair amount of spring to it, so when it hits that ball at 110 or 120 miles an hour, it compresses a little bit. Upon impact, the titanium club head stores some of the energy, then releases it into the ball, causing the ball to travel faster. So the ball speed off of this is going to be considerably higher than a wooden club, even at the same swing speed. Today, the evolution of the golf club continues, with engineers using a variety of new materials and designs to help disperse the mass of the club and deliver the perfect impact to the ball. A modern adjustable driver would probably have stainless steel in it, titanium, aluminum, some carbon fiber, all those things. There could be you know, half a dozen materials in a driver today. While club technology has dramatically evolved since the first U.S. Open in Marion, the USGA continues to ensure that skill, not technology, determines the world's best players as they compete for the 2013 U.S. Open title. Maybe it was an older video, uh, but a few concepts there that immediately came to mind. What's the mathematical expression of Newton's second law? The, the sum of force is equal to two things, mass times acceleration. So the first thing that was discussed in there is a more massive club head. So why not just make the club head like a milk jug? <laughs> There's a rule on, on how big a club head can be, and I can't recall what the units are, but what comes 460 cc's, something like that, on the volume of a club head is, is the limit. Um, so a more massive club head is able to impart uh, more acceleration to a ball for a given amount of force. Uh, second thing that came to mind, your question. So how do they distribute the mass within a club head to prevent uh, off-center shots or, or prevent the club head from rotating? Yeah, so around the perimeter of the club, 
increases its rotational inertia about uh, the twist axis. So there's less tendency for the club to rotate, so you're hitting the ball uh, with more of a square shot. Uh, the last concept, the third concept that came to mind was something we talked about back in chapter three. Remember coefficient of restitution? Um, so what's the, what's the, uh, the biggest difference between a driver with a wooden head versus a driver with more of a titanium head? has to do with the spring quality, isn't it? I like the, the visual where um, the club hits the ball with a certain amount of, of force, and then there's a certain amount of energy that's delivered back into the ball. So do you remember coefficient of restitution is, is on a scale from zero to one? And the higher the coefficient of restitution, in, in other words, the energy you return into the ball is greater as you get closer to one. So modern drivers have a coefficient of restitution of around 0.83. So most of the energy that you get in a swing is returned back into the ball, which, which results in a further drive. Um, something more general that I thought was really interesting is the technology in sports. So are we really creating better athletes or is it just the equipment that's getting better? Um, there's been some uh, biomechanical testing done comparing Usain Bolt with Jesse Owens. How many have ever heard the name Jesse Owens? 1936 Berlin Olympics won four gold medals. And he was running on a cinder track he, and, and with shoes that were much less effective as the shoes that track athletes have today. Think of the coefficient of restitution on a cinder track versus the high-tech rubberized type surfaces they have today. They compared Jesse Owens with Usain Bolt uh, in Usain Bolt's world record race back in 2009. Usain Bolt ran a 9.58, set the world record in the 100 meters. Biomechanists have, have estimated that Jesse Owens would have been right behind Usain Bolt, probably 9.6 something. Would have got second place in that race in 2009. And you think about uh, cycling is another sport. Think about the technology in bicycles. In the 1970s, Eddie Merckx set the world record for uh, riding a bike, the distance that can, could be covered in one hour's time on, on a bike back in the 1970s. Um, they've recently changed that record so that you have to ride the, pretty much the same bike that Eddie Merckx had to ride. Um, before the change, the world record um, was really only a few, a few minutes more than what Eddie Merckx was able to accomplish back in the 1970s. So I think athletes' bodies have always been amazing, but we also have to consider um, how much of a difference the technology makes um, in the mechanics and performance. So let's go back a little bit. So um, in addition to increasing angular inertia about the twist axis, um, club length affects angular inertia because longer length clubs tend to be heavier, so they're more difficult to swing. So one of the things discussed in that was making clubs lighter. So if we go back to chapter six and we use this, this equation that describes the relationship between linear and angular velocity, we can see that as we increase the length of the club head, so the radius here represents club length. As we increase the length of the club head, the linear impact velocity also increases if we keep angular velocity constant. So we think, okay, well, a longer club head means more distance off the tee, but the other factor that needs to be considered is a longer club head has a higher moment of inertia because it has more mass. 
So even though the radius of gyration is longer, even though we have a greater distance from the club head to the axis of rotation, a longer club head tends to have more mass. So to overcome that problem, um, golf manufacturers use these high-tech metals like titanium to make the club lighter. So you've got the optimal combination of a long club to impart greater linear velocity on impact, but also a lighter club, which reduces angular inertia. So you get the greatest distance off the tee. So the law of inertia applies from a linear standpoint as well as an angular standpoint. From an angular standpoint, the angular momentum of a body or object remains constant unless acted upon by a net external torque. I wish our baseball players were here today, but the torque that we use to generate angular momentum with the bat comes from our core muscles. These muscles here right around the torso can generate very high and quick levels of muscle activation which allows us to swing and put torque on the bat and create more angular momentum as we go through on contact. One of the other ways that we can interpret uh, Newton's first law is the conservation of angular momentum. So if a body or object has a certain angular momentum initially, Later on, when, when we're analyzing it a few seconds later, it can have the same angular momentum as a final. It doesn't mean that angular velocity has to be constant in both cases, because again, it could be the moment of inertia that's changing. Okay, so the moment of inertia between the initial point and the final point could change, or the angular velocity could change. All that we want is the product of these two is the same between the initial point and the final point. Okay, so last practice problem of the day. So what we're doing is we're setting the moment of inertia at the initial point of layout to the final point of the tuck. We're saying we have a conservation of angular momentum between the initial point and the final point between the layout and the tuck. And we're just adjusting the variables that go into moment of inertia and velocity to solve for what we want, which is the radius of gyration in the tuck position. Up to get started. So, moment of inertia in the layout position need two things. What do you need to solve for moment of inertia? You need mass and what else? Mass multiplied by what? Radius of gyration. So, we have the mass, which is 60 kilograms. If the moment of inertia is 15 kilograms meters squared in the layout position, okay, that's her initial position, so her, her moment of inertia in the layout position is 60 multiplied by 15, okay, and the angular velocity in the layout position is 6 radians per second. Okay, so we have all the variables to solve for angular momentum in the layout position. We also have mass and angular velocity for the tuck position. So you're solving for radius of gyration in the tuck position. 
So keep working on it just a little bit longer. squared, what do you have to do to it to get it to <coughs> this degree? And what do you have to do to k squared to get it to this k? You have to take the square root. Okay, okay, so let's take this side. So 60 kilograms multiplied by six radians per second is your velocity, okay, multiplied by 15 kilogram meters per second squared to get your moment of inertia multiplied by your angular velocity. So what do you get for your angular momentum in the layout position? Again, 60 times 15 kilogram meters squared times 6 radians per second. What do you get? All right. Okay, so. So 60 kilograms. What's the radius of gyration in the layout position? It's 15. What is it in the layout position? Radius of gyration. 15. What is it, Marshall? Kilogram meters squared. Multiplied by velocity in the layout position. What is it? So you multiply those together, what do you get? Everybody agree? Okay, over on the other side, what do we have? We have mass multiplied by what? Angular velocity multiplied by k squared. So what are we solving for? So, I mean, for that, we want to know what the radius of gyration is, but it's squared, so ultimately we have to take the square root. So, we're going to divide this side of the equation by these two. What is mass? 60. What is your angular velocity in the tuck position? It's not 6 anymore. What is it? 24. Okay, so... 5,400 divided by the product of 60 times 24 is what? It is what? Everybody agree? Okay, do this again. 5,400 divided by the product of 60 times 24 is... Do one more time. What'd you get? Ashley, what'd you get? 3.75. Okay, good, good. Just wanted to check. Okay, so how do I get k by itself? Take the square root. And what is k equal to? Meters. 
Yes. Um, you know what? I think I made a mistake with that. So yeah. So what would happen if we did square this? 60 times 15 squared times 6. How would that change this number right here? Does that change this number right here? Okay. Oh, seven point five is the answer you got. Okay. So let me sum up for today. Um, what is angular inertia equal to? It's equal to mass multiplied by what other factor? Multiplied by the distribution of, of mass. So practically speaking, what's the relationship between angular velocity and angular inertia? As angular inertia goes up, what happens to velocity? It goes down. As angular inertia goes down, what happens to angular velocity? It goes up. All right, so Thursday we'll continue with Chapter 7, maybe get into Chapter 8. Uh, again, if you're coming to lab tomorrow morning, please make sure that you wear good shoes. So we'll be in YSHB 134. Thank you.